There are no hard and fast rules when it comes to building a fantasy world or its specific components. Oh sure, there are recommendations that'll help you avoid major mistakes, but there are no real rules that you absolutely have to follow if you want to build a compelling setting or magic system for your world. That may sound a little strange as the opening words to a video about Sanderson's three laws, but it really isn't. These laws are guidelines to help you write a better, more coherent magic system, world and characters. But you don't have to follow them. That said, I personally do follow these laws since I found them to be specially helpful in my own writing journey. But what are Sanderson's three laws? How do they work? And how do you apply them in the most beneficial way to the story you're telling? In this short video, we'll explore those ideas and concepts while going over the different laws one at a time. So if you're interested in learning more about Sanderson's three laws, stick around as we delve deeper into the subject. Also, before we jump in, remember to please hit the like button. Engagement is the main metric YouTube uses to push out my video to new people, and short of a comment, the like button is the next best thing to tell YouTube that it should show this video to more people. It's easy, it's free, and you'd be doing a massive service to this channel and community. If you really like the channel, then consider subscribing as well, so that you don't miss my follow-up videos when they go live. Anyway, let's jump right in. Sanderson's three laws pertain, mostly, to the development and creation of magic systems in fantasy stories. It can be used for more than that, but we'll come back to that later. For now, we'll stick to the definition of a set of laws that help you build satisfying and narratively effective magic systems. According to Wikipedia, the idea of hard magic and soft magic was popularized by Sanderson for world building and creating magic systems in fictional settings. The terminology of hard and soft originate from hard and soft sciences, which gives us hard science fiction and soft science fiction. Both terms are approximate ways of characterizing two ends of a spectrum. Hard magic systems follow specific rules. The magic is controlled and explained to the reader in the narrative, detailing the mechanics behind the way the magic works, and can be used for building settings that revolve around the magic system. Soft magic systems may not have clearly defined rules or limitations, or provide limited exposition regarding their workings, and are used to create a sense of wonder to the reader. The three laws are 1. An author's ability to solve conflict with magic is directly proportional to how well the reader understands said magic. 2. Weaknesses, limits, and costs are more interesting than powers. And 3. The author should expand on what's already a part of a magic system before something entirely new is added, as this may otherwise entirely change how the magic system fits into the fictional world. Or, more simply, go deeper rather than wider. We'll expand on each one in a moment, but there's also another law that he calls his zeroth law, always a on the side of what's awesome. Remember though that these laws apply to creating a hard magic system. If you're creating a soft magic system, then these probably wouldn't apply to you as much. But when it comes to hard magic systems, I highly recommend you try and incorporate Sanderson's three laws. Now, let's briefly go into each law to see what he means by it and how we can use it to improve our magic systems. Sanderson's first law states that an author's ability to solve conflict with magic is directly proportional to how well the reader understands said magic. So, if you have your character in a tough situation, and they use the magic system in some way to overcome that problem, you need to ensure that the reader understands the magic system. If you use the magic system in a way that your reader is unfamiliar with, it's going to feel like a deus ex machina. Basically, it'll feel like cheating, and your reader will criticize you for it. You don't have to explain all the rules and laws of the magic system in painstaking detail. But you do need to make sure that anything the magic does to fix a problem should make sense within the rules you've already explained. Sanderson admits that he learned this law when he contravened it at the end of the first Mistborn book. I'll avoid spoilers, but there's a scene near the end where a character uses a power that wasn't explained or hinted at earlier. He does justify it in later books, but new readers are taken aback when this super convenient new source of power presents itself just at the right moment. So whenever you put your character in a tough situation, you need to ensure that whatever they do with the magic makes sense based on the rules you've already established or hinted at. Sanderson's second law states that weaknesses, limits and costs are more interesting than powers. This law basically says that it's not the cool power that necessarily makes your reader invested in the magic system. 
What almost always makes the magic system interesting is the limitations, costs and weaknesses of the magic system. This doesn't however mean that you should go overboard with limitation. So let's take Mistborn as an example again. In the story you have characters that can push and pull on metals if they are born with the ability. In order to access this power they need to consume a certain metal first. The power is basically the same as Magneto has in the X-Men, but what makes it more interesting is the limitations, costs and weaknesses. You can't just control metal as you want to. You can only push or pull on it from or toward your center of gravity. So your directions and motions are severely limited. You also need to consume a certain metal first, meaning it has a cost. On top of that, if someone comes at you without wearing any metal, your power becomes a lot less helpful. An effective weakness. The entire magic system is made a lot more interesting because there are rules in place. So when constructing your magic system, analyze it like it's a science. Ask yourself what it can and can't do. Ask yourself what it costs to do these things and ask yourself how you could try and bend the rules or exploit it in some way to make sure you don't miss anything unintentionally. Sanderson's third law states that the author should expand on what is already part of the magic system before something entirely new is added, as this may otherwise entirely change how the magic system fits into the fictional world. Basically go deeper instead of wider when it comes to expanding your magic system. When you've set up and established your magic system but want to expand in some way, don't just add more powers or more forms of magic. Rather look at what you already have and see if you can go deeper, become more granular in order to expand. The reader will appreciate it more and your magic becomes more interesting and well developed as a result. Sticking with Mistborn for examples, let's go to Era 2. In Era 2, the story takes place some hundred years after the original trilogy. Instead of adding more magic systems to the world, Brandon actually added more limitations and became more granular in the details. Instead of going wider, he went deeper. Basically, people with different abilities began to interbreed. This means that people could be born with two different abilities that already existed but that now interacted in interesting ways. At the same time, people who had once had the ability to use all the powers now no longer exist. So he found a way to limit the magic in interesting ways. But in that limitation, he also found ways to combine different abilities in the same individual. This allowed him to dig deeper on what people could actually do with the magic. So, for example, one character has the ability to push on metal, as well as store their physical weight in metal. So they can now push themselves into the air with a lower weight in order to ascend faster. They can then tap their weight back and crash down with extreme force. Or they could prevent falling to their death by radically reducing their weight. So you have two seemingly unrelated and fairly mundane abilities, pushing on metal and soaring or drawing on their physical weight. But put together you can begin to dig pretty deep into how these two abilities interact. By going deeper instead of wider, you adhere to Sanderson's third law and also make your magic system a lot more compelling. Sanderson's zeroth law states that you should always err on the side of what's awesome. Basically, it's the small caveat added to the other laws that says there may be times when you have to contravene one of the laws. When constructing a magic system and you have a great idea, but it would contravene one of the laws, this is when the zeroth law should be implemented. If you've looked into it and have considered the costs and benefits of contravening a law, but are happy with it even if it might contravene one of these laws, then totally go for it. We are writers, we're drawn in by great ideas, we get energized and excited by the things that are awesome. And for a lot of us, if we don't have that cool factor, we generally lose interest in pursuing it further. If it's a choice between doing what's awesome or what's the most technically sound, go with what's awesome. If it causes problems later on, you can always go back and fix it or you can work around it. The idea is to just prevent you from crippling yourself with limitations, costs or any of the other things we've discussed. Like a bonsai tree, you must trim and prune where necessary to keep the tree in shape, but don't let yourself go overboard and trim it down to a stub. Conversely, understand that sometimes you want a really big bonsai or a really small one and you should go with what excites you. I would caution not to be too liberal with applying the zeroth law though. There's a reason it's technically separate from the other three laws. The three laws are your guiding light and the zeroth law is the fine print that says there may be times where you have to side with the cool factor over the other laws. If, however, you only go with the zeroth law, you run the risk of having your magic system be too soft and thus it might not work as well as you want it to. 
The bonsai tree example is not the perfect analogy, but I hope it makes it clear. At the end of the day, we like what's awesome. We like what's cool. And if you find yourself getting bored because you've gone overboard and killed the cool factor, take a step back and err on the side of what's awesome. Sanderson's three laws are primarily used for constructing a magic system, but it's actually more than that. You can use it as a narrative tool for a lot of other things, from character, plot, world building, etc. For example, let's look at character and how you could, theoretically, apply these three laws. The first law talks about making it more interesting to your reader if you solve issues when they understand more. So if there's a character problem that you want to resolve, make sure that your reader understands all the characters involved well enough for this resolution to make sense. If you don't, you run the risk of making a character's actions and motivations seem out of tune and will result in confusion and frustration. The second law talks more about limitations, costs and weaknesses making things more interesting. Your characters will be more interesting not because they're awesome, but because they have flaws, weaknesses and limitations that they must overcome or work around. It's in dealing with these roadblocks that your reader becomes invested in your characters and their journey. If you ignore this law, you run the risk of writing a total Mary Sue character. The third law talks about going deeper instead of wider. So instead of adding more characters or instead of adding more aspects to an already established character in order to make things more interesting, consider going deeper. Consider exploring what we already know about this character. Can we dig deeper into their past or their feelings? Can we dig deeper with the existing cast instead of adding new people? Can we find ways to make things more interesting by pitting certain parts of a character against each other? Perhaps put their hatred of their father against their love of their mother as an example. Going deeper instead of wider will generally work out better when executed correctly. And finally the zeroth law says to err on the side of what's awesome. So sometimes you just want to go with what's cool. Maybe it would work to put the character's hatred of their father against their love for their mother, but maybe it's just cooler if they punch their dad in the face. If that's cooler and still makes sense for the character, then err on the side of what's cool. Remember, you can always fix it later, but make this choice consciously and not as a result of ignorance of the three laws. These laws can be applied to things like world building or even plot. The video could be an hour long and we could still not make it through all the different ways you can apply the laws. I just wanted to get the idea across that you can use the laws for more than just magic systems. And while they are called laws, they act more as guidelines instead of hard rules that you can never break. But remember, you should only break rules because you know and understand the rules. If you break the rules out of ignorance, that's when you run the risk of failure. If you break them deliberately to achieve a certain outcome, that's when you know you can be relatively safe from the pitfalls that would otherwise befall you. I hope you enjoyed the video and that it at least gave you some things to think about when crafting magic systems or basically anything else for your own fictional worlds. Thank you very much for watching. I sincerely appreciate all your time and attention. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like since that's one of the biggest metrics that YouTube looks at when recommending it. And if you'd like to see more, please hit that subscribe button so that you can be notified of future videos. Take care and we'll talk again very soon.